and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Ijeon in Seoul. We have a lot on our plate today, so let's get started with a look at the day's highlights. China's yuan plunged to its lowest level in three weeks against the greenback as the country's foreign reserves continued to slide. This week marks one year since the Kaesong Industrial Complex closed down, and nearly half of the firms that once operated there are still struggling to survive. These stories are more coming right up. But first, Korea has doubled the size of its currency swap agreement with Australia in extension talks which came, which came less than a month ahead of the deal's maturity date. According to Seoul's finance ministry, the Bank of Korea and the Reserve Bank of Australia have agreed to swap a, nine, a, a swap of 9 trillion won or 10 billion Australian dollars. Korea's central bank says the renewed deal, which will last until February of 2020, was put in place to boost bilateral trade and financial stability. Australia was Korea's eighth largest trading partner last year, with its currency boasting the world's fifth largest trading volume. The latest deal comes about two weeks after Korea also extended a currency swap agreement with Malaysia. Eyes were on China's foreign reserve levels on Tuesday as they dipped below the three trillion U.S. dollar mark for the first time in six years. Now, the concern is that the fall below the psychologically important line might have greater implications for countries like Korea as well. Our Kim Minji has this report. The Chinese yuan has fallen to its lowest level against the U.S. dollar in three weeks. The Chinese currency was trading at 6.88 yuan, down 0.36 percent from the previous day. The dollar continued to recover, buoyed by comments from U.S. Philadelphia Fed Reserve President Patrick Harker on Monday, suggesting that the central bank is not drilling out an interest rate hike in March. This asked a woes for China as the country's foreign reserves fell to a six-year low for January. Data from the People's Bank of China shows levels fell below the psychologically important 3 trillion U.S. dollar mark to 2.99 trillion. This is a 25 percent drop from the peak of over 3.9 trillion in mid-2014. Intervention by the central bank is seen as a key contributing factor. The PBOC has been aggressively selling dollars to curb the depreciation of the yuan. But despite these efforts, the Chinese currency weakened by 6.5 percent against the dollar in 2016, the most in over two decades. In addition, Chinese investors are accelerating this by moving money overseas. Experts say China's foreign reserves are still large enough to cushion the blow for now. The country's reserves account for roughly 30 percent of global foreign reserves and have surpassed the IMF's recommendation of between 2.6 and 2.8 trillion dollars for the country. But what's worrisome is that if the yuan continues to depreciate against the dollar despite Beijing's efforts to prop it up, the U.S. could label China a currency manipulator, which could also have a negative impact on Korea. Both countries are currently on a U.S. Treasury Department monitoring list. If tensions between the U.S. and China rise, it will inevitably hurt trade conditions, and a general slowdown in China will negatively impact Korea's trade. On top of that, there are growing concerns that Korea may also be labeled a currency manipulator, and this in turn could result in trade restrictions. Experts say while it's likely that Chinese authorities will work to prevent a sharp decline in the yuan, Korea too needs to take measures to counter potential threats. They say it needs to look for ways to increase imports from the U.S. so as to reduce its big trade surplus with the world's largest economy. Kim Minji, Business Daily. The Bank of Korea has put finding ways to boost exports as the government's priority for this year. In a meeting with economic experts on Wednesday, BOK Governor Lee joo said it's too soon for an optimistic outlook for Korea's exports despite growth in January, given the coming series of events that could potentially bring about big changes in global trade. In particular, he pointed to Brexit and the Trump administration's protectionist stance. To tackle the uncertainties, he said the Korean government must work with private businesses, which he said have a significant amount of experience and networks. Korea's exports logged double-digit growth for the first time in four years last month, jumping 
2% from last year. Korean investment in the United States jumped to a six-year high last year, but U.S. investment in Korea is continuing its fall. According to data by Korea International Trade Association, Korea invested $6.94 billion in the U.S. in the first nine months of last year. Even without fourth-quarter figures, the amount is close to the figure tallied for the whole of 2011. U.S. investment in Korea, meanwhile, has been heading in the opposite direction. It totaled $3.88 billion in 2016, down almost 30 percent from the previous year. Officials say the figure seemed to contradict claims by the Trump administration that the Korea-U.S. free trade deal only benefits Korea, as foreign investment helps boost a country's economy and creates new jobs. Korea's export of tobacco products continues to be strong. In fact, its value exceeded $1 billion for the first time last year, setting a new high. That accounts for an 11 percent jump from the year before, according to Korea Customs Service. All but 2 percent of the exports were cigarettes, with 40 percent of those shipments bound for the United Arab Emirates. Cigarette shipments to Japan and the United States also increased over the same period. This says Korea's imports of tobacco products also hit a fresh record, of which 71 percent were tobacco leaves. The U.S. auto market is the world's second largest after China, with about 17.6 million vehicles sold last year. For that reason, the place is of particular strategic importance to Korean automakers. But with the Trump administration's latest protectionist movements, the local auto industry is bracing for some big blows ahead. Our Lee Ji Young has more. Concerns are clouding the outlook of Korea's car industry after U.S. President Donald Trump threatened to slap hefty taxes on Mexican-built vehicles imported into the U.S. Most troubled by this among local producers is likely Kia Motors. Korea's second-largest auto firm had been running a $3 billion plant in Mexico since May last year with an annual capacity of roughly 400,000 cars. The automaker had initially planned to reach global sales of over 8 million units this year by exporting 80 percent of those cars to the U.S. market. But if it becomes a target of higher border taxes, that goal would be hard to achieve. In response to this increasingly harsh business environment, Kia said it will instead focus on increasing sales of its more popular models like SUVs and medium-sized sedans, which it believes will contribute to profitability. The possible renegotiation of the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement is also making the auto industry jittery. Korea Economic Research Institute says if this were to really happen, the country's car sector could see $13.3 billion in export losses a year. In what's seen as a response to Trump's aggressive push to make it America, Hyundai Motor Group, parent company of Hyundai and Kia Motors, said it will invest about $3.1 billion over the next five years and possibly build a new plant. But the conglomerate has denied its decisions have any direct correlation to the new agenda set by the Trump administration. Hyundai joins a growing list of automakers who announced investments in the U.S. market, with Japan's Toyota Motors saying it will pour in roughly $10 billion after Ford canceled plans to build a $1.6 billion plant in Mexico and decided to build it in Michigan instead. Lee ju -young, Business Daily. The number of Korean travelers choosing to spend their leisure time overseas is rising fast. According to a culture ministry report released by a ruling party lawmaker on Wednesday, the number of Koreans that traveled abroad stood at 19 million in 2015, up nearly 10 and a half percent from 20, 2011. The number of people who went on trips within Korea rose a mere 1.8 percent over the same period. Still, the overall number of Koreans traveling domestically was much higher at 38 million in 2015 compared to those going abroad.
This coming Friday will be one year since the lights went out at Kaesong Industrial Complex, once jointly run by the two Koreas. And today we'll take a look at what has changed over the past year and where things currently stand. For this, we have our Shin Zeman in the studio with us today. Hi, Zeman. Hi, Jiu. All right, so a lot has happened over the past year, but things look far from being resolved. That's right. The complex had been running since late 2004, and so it was very abrupt and difficult process for the companies involved. And I was able to visit one of the firms there. Take a look. Established three decades ago, Pyongyang Glove is the only company in Korea that specializes solely in the manufacturing of gloves. From golf gloves to cycle, outdoor and leisure gloves, the company takes a hands-on approach on everything from designing to branding. It was also one of the 123 companies operating out of the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex until the shutdown last year. It was there for eight years, with at least 500 North Korean employees working on the company's fabric production five days a week. The production line in Kaesang accounted for some 80 percent of the company's entire output, with the remaining coming from factories in Indonesia. Many of the businessmen in the complex, including myself, reap benefits from a workforce with good craftsmanship, cheaper distribution and a common language shared by the two countries. Looking back, the losses that we've been burdened with since the shutdown are incomparable to those benefits. Tremendous losses that have resulted in layoffs of half of the staff, a redirection of production lines overseas, and damaged company credit ratings. The company had invested some 4.3 million U.S. dollars in the factory up north, but only received compensation worth $740,000 since the halt, less than 20 percent of the money poured in. And in terms of performance last year, the company had initially set an $8.7 million target for operating profit, but it only managed to claw in 20 percent of that sum. The problem extends far beyond this one glove company. Looking at the businesses overall, the corporate association of the Kaesong Industrial Complex says out of the 123 firms, 11 have completely shut down, while the remaining, like Pyongyang Glove, continue to struggle to get back on their feet. And we're sure that the company that you just took us there was one of many companies that had to struggle and tr struggle to survive after the abrupt suspension of the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Now, how large of a role did the complex play in terms of its overall output? The complex in and of itself carried great weight in the sense that it was one of the last points of two Koreas of the of engagement between the two Koreas. But speaking in business terms, according to a data released in 2014 by Hyundai Research Institute, the Kazan complex helped boost demand by some $3.2 billion for South Korea since opening in 2004. For the North, it brought in an estimated $380 million in foreign currency earnings. As a major joint business project between the divided two nations, it employed some 55,000 workers, primarily from the North, and as of 2015, production value from the complex had surpassed a record $500 million, and that's according to Seoul's Unification Ministry. So it was not that significant in size, but it provided a lot of hope for companies seeing some growth uh, from their operations. But, well, you know, it's not the first time that operations at the complex were halted, though. Right. Back in April 2013, when operations were suspended for over five months, business owners were able to pack some of their belongings, including their assets, like com completed products and materials. What was different this time, which was last year, was that there was not enough of a window for companies to retrieve more than their liquid as more, more of their liquid assets. Adding to that is the fact that a lot of businesses, including including Pyongyang Glove, have gradually increased their investment and production at the complex over the years. And now that the operations have been halted indefinitely, the effects are being felt not only by the companies there, but also subcontractors that had worked with. There hasn't been a fixed number on how much damage has been incurred from the halt of the complex. Corporate Association of the Kaesan Complex says, however, that the businesses suffered a total of over $1.3 trillion since the halt. 
But we expect the losses could be greater if you include the subcontractors as well as the stores that used to sell the Kaesong made goods. But still, there seems to be a difference between the government and the companies that used to operate in the complex when it comes to compensation. So what's the latest on that front and what can we expect down the line? It is an ongoing debate, as you might expect. The 123 companies uh, with their assets still left at the complex there in Kaesong say the government has only given them a combined $423 million worth of compensation, which is what they say is just one-third of the actual losses incurred. To that, Seoul's Unification Ministry says that they have confirmed some $679 million of losses through an accounting firm and have decided to offer assistance worth $454 million. The gap between the two sides seems to stem from whether or not to reimburse them with potential operating profit that companies had expected to make. And yes, at this point, the possibility of reopening the complex still remains to be seen with the North's frequent flare-ups of tensions on the Korean Peninsula. The South Korean government is sticking to its stance that it has no plans of resuming operations unless Pyongyang changes its stance on nuclear weapons. Development. Well, let's hope that things do get resolved in the near future for these companies. Thank you so much for coming in today. My pleasure. And that wraps it up for today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.